So here we are in Minnesota, a great place to live and work, or at a minimum, a great place to be from. Believe it or not, I have heard from folks outside of the Midwest actually admit that they have no idea where Minnesota was on the map, only that it was somewhere in the middle. The middle? The Midwest, sure, but the middle is the place between two other things, like that seat on the plane that's neither aisle nor window. It's the point between two extremes, between really good and really bad. It's middling. No, Minnesota is not in the middle. It is the center. For one thing, it is located in the center of the North American continent, mostly. All things being relative, there are no coasts or regions, only directional relationships from the center. To the north is Canada, for example. To the east is stuff like Washington. Looking west, there is also Washington. And south of Minnesota is Iowa, Texas, Mexico, and everything else. Some of you may suspect a bias based on my upbringing here, but I have further scientific proof that we are all right now in the center of things. Minneapolis falls on the 45th parallel, exactly halfway between the North Pole and the equator. You can't get more central than that. And here we are on a geological map representing in color the various ages of continental rock formation. We see the bright red areas indicate rock formed about three to four billion years ago in Minnesota. Not only are we central, we were here way before anybody else. Although located centrally on the continent, Minnesota is well connected to the Earth's seas. Just as all roads led to Rome, all waterways lead to Minnesota. The Mississippi is, of course, the starting point for much of European settlement in the upper Midwest. Starting in 1819, Fort Snelling was built on a high promontory overlooking the convergence of the Minnesota and Mississippi rivers, a military outpost meant to secure the territories of the recently completed Louisiana Purchase. St. Paul exists where it does simply because it was the uppermost landing on the Mississippi for river traffic due to the whitewater rapids that stretched another eight miles upriver to Minneapolis. Once called Pig's Eye, for a saloon owner who settled there first, St. Paul became a hub of commerce and traffic for the newly opened territory. As it looks today, more buildings, less livestock. St. Paul Cathedral occupies the highest hill in the city just east of downtown, while the state capitol building occupies a slightly smaller hill to the north. Designed by famed local architect Cass Gilbert as a civic homage to St. Peter's in Rome, we made sure he finished every last detail before allowing him to move to New York, where he designed, among other things, the Woolworth Building and later the U.S. Supreme Court Building. St. Paul boasts many lovely buildings and traditions that still survive from the Gilded Age of lumber and railroad tycoons. The Victorian-inspired Como Park Conservatory, for example, and the Lower Town Farmer's Market and Winter Carnival Ice Palaces and the heroic Richardsonian Romanesque Landmark Center overlooking Rice Park. It is often repeated that St. Paul is the last city of the East and Minneapolis the first city of the West. So a point of clarification. Before you call a cab and ask the driver to take you across the river to St. Paul, please refer to the map. While Minneapolis and St. Paul share the Mississippi and one city is on the East and the other to the West, they each share both sides of the twisting river. Note Fort Snelling to the south in light gray. The little black blotches everywhere are lakes. Minneapolis exists where it does because of St. Anthony Falls, shown in the middle of this picture. It provided the water power that ran the mills that processed the lumber and later wheat harvested from the expanding Northwestern Empire. In this rendering from the 1880s, industrial buildings along the riverfront are framed by railroad bridges and the first structure to cross the Mississippi, a catenary suspension bridge that connected Nicollet Island to Hennepin Avenue, today still the main road through downtown. The Hennepin Avenue Bridge has been replaced four times. Both the west and east bank of the falls feature preserved remnants and converted mill buildings that made Minneapolis a boomtown. International brands like Pillsbury, Gold Metal Flour, and General Mills all started here. Aside from maybe Prince and First Avenue, Minneapolis may be best known for its world-class parks. Originally proposed by the city's first park commissioner, Horace Cleveland, in 1883, the city's grand round system envisioned an interconnected circuit of green space and waterways that weave together Minneapolis's residential neighborhoods and downtown civic spaces. Threading its way along 55 miles of parkway, the Minneapolis park system includes Minnehaha Falls and Creek, the chain of lakes, the sprawling 700-acre Theater Worth Park, and the formally planned Victory Memorial Drive, 
a living monument to the fallen Minnesota heroes of World War I. Across the river from downtown is the University of Minnesota East Bank Campus, also laid out by Cass Gilbert. Founded in 1851, seven years before statehood, the Twin Cities campus swarms with 52,000 students and just as many faculty and staff during the school year. And if anybody asks, the university gave Frank Gehry his early break with a design of the Weissman Art Center, located at the heart of campus overlooking the river. His museum at Bilbao came after. Of course, during your visit here, you may want to get around and look at some of this stuff. Once upon a time, the Twin Cities were served by an extensive and robust streetcar system, which stretched to the Wisconsin border east of St. Paul to the resorts of Lake Minnetonka to the west. Until the 1950s, when these two happy guys decided to buy the whole system, tear up the tracks, and burn the streetcars. The guy on the right receiving the check was later convicted of fraud and sent to the big house. They both had money tied up in General Motors. Some of the original streetcars survive. The one on the left runs on Market Street in San Francisco. The one on the right is part of a Minneapolis streetcar museum that makes short trips for tourists in the summer. In 2004, rail transit returned to Minneapolis with the launch of Minnesota's first LRT system. The Blue Line, connecting downtown to the Mall of America and the airport, carried over 10 million riders in 2013. And just this year, we opened the second line between Minneapolis and St. Paul, and last year inaugurated the first bus rapid transit corridor. The map here shows the extension of the system through the year 2030. But why ride when you can bike? For two years running, Minneapolis has been named by Bicycle Magazine as the number one bike city in the country. The reason why is largely because of projects like this, the Midtown Greenway a county-led effort to convert a former recessed train corridor traversing the city into a multimodal car-free zone. And yes, we know it snows here, so we bundle up and strap on the snow tires. It helps that bicycle paths get plowed before most city streets. And it also helps to have a senior house member in Congress find money in the transportation bill to pay for a bike and pedestrian flyover bridge over six lanes of highway traffic, the first cable state bridge in the state. If you don't own your own bike, no worries. The city's partnership with Nice Ride ensures that from spring to fall you can rent a bike for short trips between any of their 146 stations. And about those tubes in the air that people use to walk from one building to another, we call them, and there is only one right answer, not a skywalk, not a sky bridge, not elevated walkways, say it together with me, Skyway. More fun facts, the Minneapolis Skyway system is the largest in the world. It extends over eight miles and connects 80 downtown blocks. The first Skyway was built in 1962, and at the opening, the nice ladies here in sashes would escort folks across if they were nervous. And we have all kinds of Skyways. Skyways that celebrate their diagonal structure, Skyways like metal tubes from the future and double-deckers, Skyways with pretty colors, and Skyways that go nowhere. Skyways that go on forever, and postmodern skyways that pretend they were shipped from Florence. But my favorite skyways are the four connected to the IDS Tower and Crystal Court. Completed in 1973 and designed by Philip Johnson, the IDS project was designed to transform an entire block into a city within the city. The soaring atrium space was modeled on a European piazza, anchored by the 57-story office tower as its campanile, and surrounded by shops and restaurants. When completed, it towered over the city as well as the tallest building that preceded it, the 1929 Fauché Tower. At the request of its owner, Mr. Wilbur Fauché, the quirky landmark was patterned after the Washington Monument. Today you can get drinks at the top at a bar called Prohibition. Over the last decade, Minneapolis saw a flurry of new building projects that have drawn international interest while elevating the intensity of local discourse regarding the way we plan for, design, and fund local cultural institutions. Target Field, the home of the Minnesota Twins, got rave reviews when completed for its use of local stone and success in dealing with a compact urban site close to the downtown core. The addition to the Walker Art Center by the Swiss powerhouse Herzog and Demeron makes many appreciate the original windowless Edward Larrabee Barnes even more. Caesar Pelli designed a new, user-friendly central library with a dramatic prow that dropped icicles over the entry Oops. until it was fixed. While over at the Minneapolis Institute of Arts, a new enormous Michael Graves edition was built, 
though not shown in this photo out of respect to the beautiful McKim Mead and White original. The Guthrie built its new three-theater complex on a choice piece of real estate overlooking St. Anthony Falls with an endless bridge design authored by Jean Nouvel of the Parisian nightclub circuit. Its bravura does not make locals miss the original Ralph Rapson building any less. And on the east side of downtown Minneapolis rises a gigantic O to the Viking longboat in the form of a 300-foot-high faceted stadium for football and monster truck rallies. Fireworks are optional. For the most part, these projects were all led by out-of-town architects. What is too often overlooked is the quality of architectural design we don't need to import from foreign shores or even distant coastlines. So here are a few that, while less grandiose, make life in Minnesota all that much sweeter. Starting with this, the recently completed branch library in uptown Minneapolis by our own local comrades and 2013 AIA Architecture Firm of the Year, VJAA. And this preservation tour de force, the Mill City Museum in the ruins of a former flour mill by architects MSR, a study in simplicity and grace for a mausoleum at Lakewood Cemetery by Joan Serrano and John Cook at the Minneapolis-based firm HGA. A rough-and-tumble border crossing station in War Road, Minnesota gets crisp detailing by Snow Krylik Architects. And a house perched on a rock above Lake Superior by regional minimalist master David Selmala. Life really is good in the center.